It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 285 of Science on Top. Today's Sunday, the 10th of December, 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. Yeah, December 2017, which means it's time to take a look back at all our favourite stories from the year. And it was a big year. We had gravitational waves, we saw the end of the Cassini mission... 105 very plausible theories for why Tappy's star has such an erratic brightening and dimming pattern. There were also a lot of archaeology discoveries, lots of stories about babies. Everything happened this year. So let's jump straight in. And I think, Lucas, we should probably start with the Nobel Prize winning discovery, gravitational waves. After two observations in 2015 that were published in 2016, there were four detections in 2017. It was a really big year for gravitational waves, wasn't it? Huge. And, and now we have, you know, as a consequence of these, these discoveries, we now have gravitational wave astronomy, which wasn't a thing prior to that, which is so cool. I mean, first detection 2015, and then, you know, we've had, uh, what, five now, I think, since then. It's getting, you know, it's, it, I think we will, and, and I think I might have already said this on the show before, we're going to get to the point it's going to be a little bit like, discovering extrasolar planets, you know, it's like another one. We get a bit bored with it because it just happens so much. But it's just so awesome because it's a new, it's a new tool that we have to, to understand the universe. And most recently we had uh, the, this detection of two neutron stars colliding. And again, you know, we managed to learn a whole lot of new stuff about an event such as this, things that had been theorized but not quite, um, certainly never observed directly and... and um, you know, it adds to the body of knowledge. But I think for me, one of the things I, I, that, that really struck a chord with regard to the gravitational wave um, discoveries was these, these were not easy to find. We had to build very specific detectors to find these that, that, that relied heavily upon our understanding of physics and, and predictions that were made by our understanding of physics and by particularly by uh, Einstein's uh, you know, theories of, of gravity. So it's the understanding of these theories that leads to predictions, which leads us to ways of testing the predictions. And that's really key to science. And I think that's a key difference between you know, science and, and belief systems, which are, you know, I've, I've heard people compare science, the scientific process to a belief system, that oh, you put so much faith in science. I'll see I do put a lot of faith in science because it does actually give you the ability to make predictions about the world around you and then formulate a method to go out and test those predictions. And it's the same sort of thing that we've talked about before with regard to modeling. And often it comes, you know, it comes up in conversation with regard to modeling for climate science because that, you know, I hear a lot of people poo-pooing the models like, oh, we can't even get the weather forecast right and this sort of thing. But, but the reality is, if you, if you construct a model, just as if you construct a test such as they did with, uh, with LIGO, for example, to detect gravitational waves, if you construct a model which is able to uh, predict the weather that you experience over a period of time in certain locations in the past, so you can compare it with actual observations from the past, then you know you have a model that it that that has sufficient data and has uh, has been well constructed enough to actually make predictions about the future. So I, I think um, these are the things that, that with stories such as gravitational waves that that always jump at me. That you know this this came directly out of a very well tested, well understood theory that explains what we see and explains the world around us. That is general relativity, and that information allowed us to go. If this is true, then we should see this. How do we detect it? This is how we'll detect it. And we did. And it's so cool. And it actually reminds me a lot of the story of um, uh, the cosmic microwave background. Mm -hmm. So when the cosmic microwave background um, uh, was discovered, it had been proposed already. It was a, there was a, um, a two astronomers, uh, Rolf Adler and, and uh, sorry, Rolf Alpha 
and um, and Robert uh, Robert Herman, who who published a study back in about 1948, saying that if if Einstein's theories were accurate and there was in fact um, this so-called Big Bang uh, that, that that started the the whole universe, then as a consequence of that, there should be this radiation, this microwave frequency radiation all around us in every direction that we observe. And it should be roughly about, you know, five Kelvin uh, heat uh, as that of black body radiation. And they were off by two Kelvin, which is, you know, extraordinary. And it was, (laughs) it was, it was like 15 or so years later that, that, that the discovery was actually made, which we've talked about again on the show before, um, you know, by, by other scientists who were trying to, to, you know, eliminate some some mm. interference, interference in there yeah so um so when it was found it was a case of oh look how do you know you know this 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 prediction came out simply out of our understanding of physics and and working our way through the problem going well if this and this and this are true then this should also be true and then what do you know we we <laughs> found it to be true so yeah that's science i love I, it i think i think the gravitational wave thing as you say it's a great demonstration of our understanding of physics and modeling and predictions uh, coming true. It's also an extraordinary example of precision engineering. Oh, man. That we can build equipment that can detect the slightest movement of a, a, a one, one, was it one one thousandth of the diameter of a proton or something ridiculous like something that? Something absurd like that. I mean, it's just, you know, they, they even have measurements that small, like, <laughs> you know. A plank length or something. It was just stupid. Yeah. It was just so small. But that's awesome. I mean, how incredible is that? Yeah. Um, and also, of course, the latest one, the neutron star detection, was coupled with a detection of gamma waves at about the same mm. time. Again, mm. proving all our theories and everything at this as well, which is really, yeah. So really the, the detection of gamma rays being important because this had been theorised as as being one of the um, potential uh, um, sources of gamma rays of these gamma ray bursts is um, is these collisions of neutron stars, but we, we didn't have an event to tie it to up until this point. And then we had the arrival of gamma rays and gravitational waves at more or less the same time um, from one event. So, I mean, it's just a beautiful, yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful illustration of the predictions. Very, very cool. Um, and also, we did a lot of history stories and archaeology stories, as I mentioned. Penny, this year we looked at concrete which is ubiquitous these days, but when you look back at Roman structures built with concrete, especially aqueducts, you find that even though they didn't use mortar, those structures have still held up amazingly well over the past 2,000 years. And now we think we know why, don't we? Yeah, and apparently especially their um, seawalls, so anything that was interacting with seawater has just been astonishing uh, in terms of strength and how much it's remained. And what um, this study found was that it's the materials that they used to make the concrete. Um, they used lime and volcanic ash to bind with the rocks. And when it reacted with um, seawater, instead of eroding, essentially um, this crystal, this mineral um, that was found in the water called um, tobam- Al- or was it tobamorite and tobam- philipsite, yeah. Um, actually grew and made the strong concrete even stronger. So I, I really like this story for two reasons. One, because it sort of helps explain, you know, a bit of the quote-unquote wisdom of the ancients because I think, um, you know, they didn't really have precise recipes. They didn't know what really what was going on chemically, but they did know that with these local materials that they had, it worked really well. And the other thing is the like, potential applications of this in the future um, especially for um, any concrete construction in the sea because, I mean, our concrete is not as sturdy essentially with the formula it's usually made from. It's not environmentally friendly either um, to create. So the longer it lasts, the better it is. So I just I really liked that. I liked the mix of chemistry, a bit of geology and mineralogy, a bit of archaeology and history. Yeah, I thought that was a really fun story. And I like what you say about how, you know, they – didn't necessarily know why their concrete was working so well, but obviously you're on a winning formula, you stick to it. You stick with it, yeah. <laughs> like I'm just I'm also imagining that they're, you know, one of their their uh, engineers or, or uh, 
you know, scientists of the time is like, so why is it so strong? I don't know. It just works, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember hearing, and I don't, I've never looked up a source for this, but I'm sure one of my lecturers at uni said that when they, you know, obviously the Romans had quite a large empire and in some areas their structures were just completely terrible because, I mean, they didn't know what they were doing really. Like they're like, oh, here's a red rock that looks kind of like the red rock at home. But it would be a completely different rock that they'd use in their concrete and it just would fail. Um, so it, it was a kind of a bit more rough and ready than we might like to think. But it kind of reminds me of, I think it's, it's the Asimov quote that, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology yeah. appears to be magic to other people. Well, this, you know, we've got this amazingly good concrete. We don't know how it works, but it's amazingly good. But then you go back and you analyze it with, I think it was X-ray and yeah. micro diffraction and stuff, and you go, okay, it's not uh -huh. magic. It's just tobomor to what the weird <laughs> chemical <it> thing, <laughs> tobomorite <laughs> and philipsite. Uh, shall we move back into the space realm? And uh, 2017 also saw the end of an era as the uh, uh. sea. <laughs> I know. Pull, pull yourself together, Lucas. We can do this. Uh. The Cassini probe was deorbited and plunged into Saturn after its extraordinary 20-year mission. And uh, you're still still feeling it, aren't you, Lucas? I am still feeling it. But there are still so many amazing images out there that you <laughs> you can use as your wallpaper. <laughs> there are so many of them. Um, I love Cassini. I, I, I think um, Cassini and Hubble are, are just, you know, a very special place in my heart it's because they've got, you know, optical cameras on them and, you know, we've got eyes so we can see photos. It's just a match made in heaven or, you know, JPL. So it's, yeah, I, I miss Cassini a lot. And I, I think in terms of design of a craft, this thing was amazing. It was just incredible. The, the mission that it ran, the extended mission that it ran, the the images it sent back, the the fact that it went on, you know, and, and just exceeded design expectations over and over again. It's just incredible. Um, uh, you know, we've talked about the science a lot over the years because 20 years, come on. <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, we've learned all about these moons, which are just, uh, just incredible. I mean, it really gave Saturn and its moons an identity. It, it, it gave it a, you know, it, it became a character, not just a, a distant, you know, celestial body. And I, I just think that's, that's so great for, for engaging with the public and, and, and pulling people into science and making them interested. And now kids now can have, um, posters of this stuff on their, on their walls of, uh, of, of these incredible images. You know, when I was a kid, we only had, you know, we had some of the very first pioneer. Uh, images that had come back from Saturn and, and of course later on much later on in my life was the Voyager images came back so yeah it's 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 a it's an amazing craft and and it will be missed but it's not just uh that it's also that it uncovered these potential reservoirs of life these uh, yeah. the moons of Enceladus and Titan yeah. and all these possibilities that now give up and coming scientists, something to think about and to look we towards. Have, yeah, we've got yeah. all of these other potential places to look for life now, as you say, Enceladus, this crazy, crazy moon that's spewing out ice volcanoes. I mean, building the E ring of, 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 uh, of Saturn. We've got Titan itself that, you know, obviously we had the Huygens probe that was attached to, to uh, Cassini when it, when it got out there and, and it, it sent this little probe, this little lander down to the, the surface of Titan, a huge moon, bigger than our moon. It's, um, you know, it's, it's massive and it actually has oceans on it, oceans of, of, uh, of hydrogen and, and methane. It's just, it's just incredible. Really, really cool. And there's so much more to be found out there. We need more, more probes. <laughs> well, funny you should mention that because while we may be mourning the loss of Cassini, we can also marvel at the success so far of the Juno probe, which is currently oh. examining Jupiter. So it entered orbit in 2016, but this year is when we've begun getting loads of exciting data back. And the cool thing about Juno is is the the orbits that it's been placed in these really eccentric, you know, deep dive orbits that it's been doing. And it's 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 passes of of Jupiter so so quick. It's amazing how fast it's skimming across, you know, the the surface. And we're getting these polar images now that we've never seen. We, we you know again. 
Hmm. The, the identity, the, the character that is Jupiter, which has, you know, held our imaginations for so long. And there's, you know, we've got so many beautiful photos of, and artist uh, renditions of Jupiter. And, you know, we, we see anim- amateur astronomers turning out incredible things now, day in, day, day out. I think of Andy Casely, uh, uh, Helen mm-hmm. Maynard Casely's husband, you know, some of the, uh, the photos he, he, he takes with his, his gear is uh, just inspiring. But, but now we've seen the, the poles of Jupiter, and oh my God, I mean, just like when we saw the poles of Saturn, um, you know, we, we, we saw these weird hexagonal uh, storms uh, in the North Pole of Saturn, now we've got these crazy, you know, beautiful uh, images coming from the, from the South Pole of Jupiter, with all these, these, these massive storms and, and swirls and so forth, it's just... Speckled it's just marble type effect, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and I think of the. Uh, there used to be in my in my youngest son's room. There used to be a a series of planets, these balls that were hanging from little strings, you know, throughout his room. And we we tried to sort of hang them up roughly to scale using his <laughs> the light in his room as the sun, and we we had these all of these things hang around his room. And I think of this little ball that was Jupiter, which was really cool. But man, they missed they missed <laughs> some really cool features at the bottom. If only they knew. Because that yeah. would have been really cool to lie in bed and stare up out of it, I think. <laughs> but but it won't be around anywhere near as long as as uh, as Cassini. It's a uh, much much shorter mission. So uh, yeah, we'll be. Um, well, it was it's a it's a seven year mission, and I think five of those years was just getting to getting Jupiter, there. and then just two years there. of actual exactly. science sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. which would be sad. Although you know, we say that. How many yeah, NASA but, um, missions have lasted longer than they're meant to? Yeah, true, but you know, different power situation yeah, there. Yeah. Cassini had a plutonium, um, you know, heat source, so it um, it had a lot of power. You know, it, it was able to use this heat source for a long, long time. Whereas um, uh, Juno hasn't got that benefit, unfortunately. So it it really does have a, a fixed uh, expiry date. Okay, I don't know exactly how long it will be, but uh, but much, much, much certainly won't hit the twenty year mark or anything close to it. Oh well. Hopefully there'll be more things <laughs> to look at. By I mean, it's no slouch. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. not saying that it sucks or anything like that. It's still awesome. It just won't. Be I, I don't think anyone listening is really thinking that you're saying it sucks. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I want them to be absolutely certain that I'm not criticizing Juno. It's awesome. We love you, Juno. We do indeed. We're all of the above. I feel like I'm channeling Bill Nye tonight. Just with my <laughs> You are. You sound like you need a, a, a nice cup of tea and uh, maybe a, yeah. some relaxation. But uh, no, your enthusiasm is well warranted. Because mm. also this year there was a story about an amazingly well-preserved dinosaur found in Alberta, Canada. And this, I think, was found by some coal miners and then it was painstakingly restored and now you'd almost swear it was a statue carved in the Renaissance. It is an immaculate uh, legacy of that dinosaur, isn't it, Penny? Yeah, it's just amazing. I feel like I'm especially attuned to dinosaur stories this year. My oldest <laughs> child is four and um, everything dinosaur is popular at my house. But this dinosaur, um, Boreal O. Pelter, I'm not quite sure if that's a correct pronunciation, but whatever. Um, yeah, it's just preserved so, so very well. It look, it does look like a statue. Like it looks like <laughs> a dragon, essentially. Mm-hmm. It looks like a dragon having a rest. It's like having a sleep. <laughs> just, just lay down for a moment. On its bed of gold. Yeah, it does. It does. And it, it was an ankylosaur, a sort of a group of um, kind of armoured dinosaur. Um, and what I think was really interesting about it is not just that it was preserved and looks amazing, which I feel is just worth noticing in itself, but just by analyzing some features of it, like the skin and looking at it, I think there was this idea of we could get an idea of what pigments it had, its kind of camouflage and so on. I just, yeah, I really enjoyed hearing about this um, dinosaur and thinking about it's life and just just how so much of what we know about dinosaurs is often from, you know, oh, we've reconstructed this entire species from, like, two ankle bones yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And then here's this one, like, yes, we know what it looked like. It was really cool. Yeah. Because especially, I mean, this will get any soft bits where obviously normally we're just extrapolating from the bones that, well, the skin probably covered them loosely, but we don't know if there were bulging bits or, you know, soft tissue that would otherwise have been uh, worn away. 
this is a really cool indication of that. I also love the story of how it was found and excavated and that. So these uh, miners, you know, they accidentally struck it with the digger and then they went, well, this isn't coal, this is something different. And I don't think they did very much damage to it. They had the wherewithal to go, whoa, okay, pull back, call the university, let's get this removed before we dig through it. Mm. Um, and I think when they were trying to lift it up, they, they had it all very carefully, um, you know, wrapped in with ropes and everything. And then something broke and it split down the middle when it hit the ground. But it was still in very good condition, which is kind of kind of cool. I just, um, what are the odds that one of the people at the site had said, I reckon we should have one more around there, just one more. They're going to be fine. Mate, it'll be fine. You're such a worry ward. And then when it snapped, he's just gone the, I told you so, look. Oh, <laughs> huh? uh, dear. All right. Um, and so, Penny, there is also, and I'm almost loathe to bring this up, but at the beginning <laughs> of the year, Casper Addiman, who's a lecturer of, in developmental psychology at the University of London, teamed up with music psychologist Lauren Stewart to create, quote, a song scientifically proven to make babies happy. Is this the sort of thing that might make babies happy but parents go insane? Do I risk oh, playing some on the show? I wouldn't play it. I mean, like, I'm not saying it's a bad song. <laughs> Maybe just a few seconds. Ring, ring on the bicycle. Beep, beep in the No, it's like, it's a pretty cute little song. And I just, I think there wasn't really, I remember not really thinking, there's not that much depth to go into here. Like, But it was just, it was just a cute sort of avenue of research. I think, like I work with small children, I have small children, and it's easy to forget sometimes that they're not just miniature grown-ups. And they have their own kind of worlds and their own perceptions and stuff they do that is just, it's nice to think of something that really is just for them, not just what grown-ups think mm-hmm. they should have and what think they should like. It's tailor-made to where they are developmentally. Yeah, it's it's nice. I, I, I liked it. <laughs> um, I did not, however, like put the song on my iPod to play in the car, though. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Stick to the Frozen soundtrack. Stick to the Frozen soundtrack. Uh. And can I just plug the Moana soundtrack? Is a nice variety. Moana. <laughs> Uh, is that that's a Disney movie? Is it Moana? That is a Disney movie. You'd be surprised. I haven't actually kept up with uh, with the your Disney princesses, Disney oh, stuff. No, no. Mm. need to get back into that. I've got out of touch, <laughs> to be honest. My, my kids are getting too old. Yeah, I've, I've you've aged realized, out of it. Yeah, I've just realised I don't know what you're talking about, and I feel uh, I feel old. Suddenly old. Yeah. <laughs> so you're teenagers. You're probably listening to See, My I'm Chemical Romance and Avenged Sevenfold or something, are you? Uh, no, there, there's old people music you just know there. That <laughs> that probably yeah, I was is. Gonna say. <laughs> oh dear, uh, times they are changing. Uh, <laughs> another one, another old one. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if anyone was going to say anything to that. Penny, in 2017, we also saw a possible solution to a long-running debate in geology. We might now know just how thick continental plates are. Yeah, probably 160 kilometres, give or take. Cool. (laughs) (laughs) No, I just really like this. Um, I do love a good geology story and I feel like geology is often one of the less sexy sciences, you know. You don't have cute animals. You don't have – well, I mean, I guess you've got volcanoes and so on, but plate tectonics, it doesn't often make the headlines. And I just enjoy thinking about these different kinds of things. So, yeah, I, I liked the way that they um, did the study by looking at the sort of changes in seismic velocity, so how seismic waves are um, distributed through the different layers of the earth. But I just sort of um, – everything plate tectonics I find fascinating because it is such a young science. Like yeah. even, um, you know, evolutionary biology is – a couple of hundred years old now, but plate tectonics is really, really recent. Like 
Um, Sorry, and 50 or 60 years old. 50 or 60. When, it, when was it? Sort of the 50, 60s, I think, it really started um, as opposed to just being considered a crackpot thing. I know my mum remembers when she was at uni, her lecturer said, oh, we've got to tell you about this crazy theory called plate tectonics, but, <laughs> you know, like let's not worry too much about it. And that's not that long ago. Is that like a teach the controversy sort of? Yeah, essentially. <laughs> yeah, like, then. oh, you know. We've got to tell you this. It's mandated. We've got to tell you like this, more. but it's just a bit crap. But, yeah, so, I mean, I think it's, I mean, in any science, you think, oh, there is so much we don't know. But, yeah, this was fun. Um, no, it, it is very interesting. And as you say, to I think also just to be able to tell the depth of something that is so deep underground mm. sort of thing, eight, what was it, 80 to 120 miles yeah. Thick crust, and to be able yeah. to measure something like that from standing on top of it <laughs> and sending signals and that, I think is very, very awesome. But, and you wanted to talk about sexy science, Penny. This year we <laughs> talked about dragonflies and how they're faking it to avoid having sex with male dragonflies. I mean, doesn't get much sexier than this. Oh, except so they're faking their own except deaths. Except they're faking their own deaths to avoid sex. But apart oh. from that, how bad remember. is the sex if you have to pretend to be dead to avoid it? <laughs> to be honest, I just remember having a lot of fun with you guys just chatting about this story. <laughs> like, <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> Poor dragonflies. I, if this doesn't get an Ig Nobel, I will be shocked. So this behaviour is called sexual death feigning and it, it protects females against aggressive males. So... Um, what the female dragonflies do is if they see a male who they don't want to have sex with, they freeze midair, crash to the ground and lie motionless so the male doesn't waste his time having sex with them. Um, apparently only five species do this, have this behaviour, including a spider and a praying mantis. Um not sure if humans are one of the species or not. <laughs> not in my – well, no, not in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> You've never feigned your own death? No. no um, oh, my God. Like, I met this amazing guy, but then he just texted me and said he was dead. So. <laughs> yeah. We're halfway through and suddenly he just dropped dead. I mean, like, what's a girl supposed to do? Just joke. Uh, um, yeah. But, so, but like, I – are male dragonflies particularly aggressive, or do they? Is this something like they bite their heads off afterwards, or something? We, I, well, I'm. Is it just fussy female dragonflies, or we don't know? Maybe. I think the males can get quite aggressive. Apparently, there's often an oversupply of males in this species, mm. and they can damage um, the female. Probably a sort of a competition thing as well. If you know, yeah. you've already impregnated, but I'll try and get in there anyway, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. She's already laid her eggs. They've yeah. already been fertilized. She doesn't need it anymore. There's no, you know, benefit right. from her um, for her. Then she doesn't. Yeah, right. And they know that they were faking it, by the way, because when the scientists went up to the female dragonflies, they flew off. <laughs> so, so it was it was a particular behavior wow. for a particular purpose. I I I, th I I remember thinking it was hilarious. Uh, just this going to extreme lengths, just just falling out of the air, crashing to yeah, the ground, crashing to the it's ground. It's like, hey, baby, no, I'm dead. I'm dead. I just died. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm dead. Yep. Yeah, that keeps happening to me today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the fourth dead <laughs> female in a row. But it's also you must think there'd be some degree of risk if you suddenly freeze and fall to the ground from whatever height you are at. I mean, mm. presumably they sort of control it somehow. But yeah, yeah, it's a scale thing, isn't it? You know, it's like where ants can jump mm. off rocks and, and not hurt themselves, but uh, you know, you, uh, oh, they, cats they do. jumping. Oh no, cats a bad example. They got all those nine lives. We did talk about ants that parachute from the tops of trees uh, to get away from oh, invaders. I that. Yeah, that's a very good point. Well, I think uh, they're the main highlights, of course. There are lots of really interesting stories. We also did a number of really interesting interviews uh, with some fascinating people. We talked to uh, Dr. Steve Salisbury about his adventures uh, looking for dinosaurs in the uh, northwest of Australia in the deserts there and also in Antarctica. Mm. It's fascinating. Mm. Uh, of course, I think we have to mention Lynn Kelly whose amazing theory oh. about memory and Stonehenge and her book, The Memory Code, which is so engrossing. I know you guys both uh, read that and loved the book. 
Yeah, it was fantastic. Mm. Yeah, really, really good. Great interview too. Lynn, Lynn was just fantastic. And, and I think, as I said at the time, we could do, you know, eight one-hour-long yeah. <laughs> interviews with Lynn and just not even scratch the surface. Definitely. I think uh, really good value. we'll have to see if we can get her on again next year and uh, follow up with uh, the things that we didn't get around to talking about last time. Yeah. Um, of course, Katie Mack, who's now gone over to North Carolina as a professor mm-hmm. over there. Amazing Always discussion. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was a great, great interview. And uh, Lucy Green, of course, that was a that was a great interview. Solar as well. scientist, yeah, really good fun. So, Talking sun science. So we'll, we'll have links to uh, all the interviews I think that we did in the show notes. That might be the best way to do it. And if uh, you missed any of them, definitely uh, check them out again because yeah, mind blowing stuff in so many of them. But I think that's our show. Unless anyone wanted to raise anything else, we're all good. Don't think so. All right, all good. It. This Have a good Christmas. E- yes. Uh, this episode was edited on a one-horse open sleigh by Marcos Benamu. <laughs> we will have all the links to those stories on the web, scienceontop.com slash 285. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and a pleasant festive season to everyone. And a very big thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us out. Uh, we'll be taking a short break. We'll be back again probably around the end of January. But in the meantime, of course, we'll have our bloopers episode out. Keep an eye on scienceontop.com for that. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next year, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. That whole last bit, I had, I was on the verge of a sneeze. And just when I finished it, it went away. And it's like, oh, well, okay. I was, I was rushing. It wasn't obvious.